in the limited amount of time that we have, I'd like to talk about what's become a really important topic, not only for me, but certainly for the companies and organizations that I have the pleasure to work with. And that's the topic of the kind of the future of work and where we're going to land in kind of the new normal. I'm going to share some ideas and then again, open it up to questions. Please feel free if at any time I say anything that really strikes you and you're kind of eager to actually ask a question or share your insights, please do that, you know, if it strikes you or write it down and we'll get it um, later on in the process. So I know a bunch of you, but for those of you I don't know, just to give you a little bit of background. So I run a small consulting firm and our business is corporate strategy and innovation. Um, we also do some work around leadership development. And so the heart of what we do is really we help companies to kind of and organizations to reach their full potential by coming up with the best new ideas and bringing those ideas to market. And so during the process of doing that work, a number of our customers have been asking, well, I, my bigger issue is how do I keep and engage people when they've often had to work virtually? And so I find being able to engage people is vital to getting people to think strategically and innovatively. And so that's become kind of a hot topic. And so with a number of organizations, we've been working on that. And to be smarter about that, I spent a couple of months actually talking with lots of our customers, talking with their leaders, their key HR leaders, um, and talking with some of their most talented employees to really find out kind of what people were thinking about during this kind of world where a lot of people are working virtually. Now, I know a bunch of you um, probably don't have the luxury, I guess we call it a luxury now of working virtually, or have folks who are working, um, they have to go into work every day. They could be in retail, they could be in distribution, they could be, in, my wife's a nurse, they could be in healthcare. And so for those folks, the world hasn't changed dramatically, um, even with the pandemic. Um, so I'd like to think the things we talk about are still equally relevant to you, whether or not you're, you and your team are going into work every day or working remotely. But it's interesting to me as I talk to people and as I kind of look at the world of work to find um, that what began as a blip in terms of us wondering if maybe in a month or two we'd go back to work is now in its 23rd month. That's the pandemic. And it really has changed the way that an awful lot of people think about working. It's particularly changed the way that new hires think about working because in many of our organizations, we have an awful lot of new folks who may not have ever been into the office. They may not have spent much time actually with their colleagues. And um, they may have a totally different notion about kind of what the world of work looks like. Um, it turns out as I talk to more and more people with the exception of older workers who have kind of a history of wanting to go into the office um, or bosses who don't know how to manage people really well when they're working remotely or some people who just want to get out of the house or their apartment and go to the office. It turns out that most people have figured out how to work out to working at home with dogs and uh, to working remotely. And in fact, an awful lot of people kind of like it and it's changed the way they think about the world of work. Um, so let's get into a little bit about what we have to do kind of differently and kind of what the world looks like, because um, I think there's some fun stuff for all of us to be kind of wrestling with. Um, the first thing I want everybody to think about is we have a greater appreciation now that work is the stuff we do as opposed to the place where we do it. So if we think about it, prior to the pandemic, a huge part of work was where we do work. And it was typically in an office or a place of business. And we dutifully went there kind of every single day, just because that's the way work happened. Um, certainly, we didn't want to miss anything. We didn't want to miss kind of key conversations, the chance to connect with our boss, um, the chance to be part of something and offer our input. Um, but the world of work is no longer viewed by an awful lot of people as where I do it, but rather what I do and how I get it done. Um, the challenge for an awful lot of bosses 
is the simple notion that when people were coming to the office, I had a rough idea, I thought they were doing work. And now as they're working remotely, I feel less connected with them and less sure about actually what they're doing, unless I feel comfortable trusting them and letting them get work done. But if we think about it now, the world of work is potentially anywhere. This actually has some huge benefits for a lot of us who are in the business of employing people. Because what it means is, as long as we're willing to be flexible and comfortable with people working anywhere, we literally can get the best talent from anywhere. We literally can put a job up. If you look at an awful lot of the kind of interesting jobs that are listed on places like LinkedIn or Indeed, what you'll find is that they're almost all saying that this job can be done remotely. The notion that I can find the best talent in places where people can either afford to work or like to be, and that they'll stay connected to me and periodically they'll come into the office is kind of a new notion that I think is here to stay. Um, another thing tied to that that we need to understand is organizations now realize in the world of work that they need to be way more flexible than they've been before. And flexibility means that in large part that they get to understand the people who work in their organizations and that they give them more flexibility than they have in the past about where they work, how they get their work done, when they get their work done, how they collaborate. That suggests that we need to trust people. Um, now, I'd argue we always needed to trust people, um, but it seems to an awful lot of leaders, the whole equation of trust is a little bit more challenging to them when they think about the fact that they don't get to see people regularly. They've got to basically be good at making sure they know what people are doing, um, know what people are responsible for, and then letting those people make it happen. Um, they need to be better at letting people be autonomous because people are working in kind of autonomous work environments. One of the exciting things I found is that not only do we have pretty good technology, but the technology keeps getting better and people get better at using it. So the reality is lots of basic meetings that we do, whether it's a Zoom call like this or a meeting in which we even do a little bit of collaboration, um, it can be done using some of the tools we have. How many of you, just kind of curious, have used combined Zoom with a tool called Miro? Um, if you haven't, just make a note of that because Miro is actually a pretty powerful tool that allows people to do some collaborative work working remotely. And it's relatively easy to use. Um, and it's a way where you can create whiteboards and get everybody who's in a meeting to participate and add value to that meeting. Hey, Alan. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who are with a public education, how do you spell Moreau? Oh, just like the artist. So M-I-R-O. And yeah, and so go to their website. It's actually- I was say, again, speaking on, on behalf of the, of the public education, that Moreau artist didn't help either, but I, I appreciate the spelling. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I appreciate it. Good question. Yeah, and it's simply M-I-R-O. Yeah, so it's a really interesting tool that allows you in advance to- create a whiteboard or a series of whiteboards, convene a meeting, and then give everybody permission to add things to those whiteboards and participate. So it's a lovely kind of tool. Um, so technology has enabled us to be better. But what all of this suggests is that we've got to be really focused on the culture of our organizations, given that some people aren't there all the time. I'd argue that the most important thing for all of us to think about related to culture is to think about what the hallmarks of our culture were before the pandemic, and then to do some thinking about how we take those hallmarks and adapt them to a world that is kind of hybrid, both virtual and in person, um, as a way to kind of think differently. If our culture before was high touch and high engagement and high acknowledgement of people, we've got to figure out ways wherever they are to do those things. If our culture was one of sharing information with people, we've got to do a better job of making sure that the information we want to share gets to everybody in a form it gets to, no matter where they're working. Now, I'd love you to think about the simple notion 
that it also forces us to be even better connected and more understanding of our people. And I love to give this example. So let me kind of share this. I have a few props here. I have no slides. I have no idea how to create a slide, but I have a few props. And so here I want you to think of an absolutely beautiful shoe. This is my L.L. Bean kind of main hunting boot. It's actually waterproof. It's pretty good in the snow. And I wear a size 11 and a half. And I tell you that only because it'll make you kind of understand what I want to share with you. So think about the main hunting boot, have that focus in your mind. I'll put it down for a second. Imagine that we took all of our employees, all of our team members, whether you have one or five or or 10 or 100 or 500, and we took them to the store so we could go to, well, so there's an L.L. Bean store, I think, right up by Pike and Rose. And we said, this is great. We've decided to have a company shoe. And so we want everybody to wear the same shoe. And so what I'd like to get is 100 pairs of the L.L. Bean main hunting boot in a size 11 and a half. And I distribute those shoes to everybody. And you know, fortunately for me, that's my size, so they feel pretty good. And other people are gonna say, whoa, these shoes are kind of gigantic. They don't fit me very well. And still other people are gonna say, well, I don't know, these shoes are kind of cramped. They don't fit me pretty well. And then there might even be some people that say, well, you know, these shoes are kind of unattractive. They're really not my style. Well, why would I mention that? Well, it turns out in most organizations, that's exactly how we think about compensating and engaging people. We tend to think about everybody by some basic system or standard we've created. Um, and that system or standard says, you know, if you fit into this, that would be great. We have job classifications, we have pay grades, we have salary ranges, we provide the same benefits to everybody. And those might be really good ideas to have, but the reality I think that we've learned from the pandemic is that everybody is unique and our ability to keep the best people is tied to our ability to connect with people. And I believe fundamental to connecting with people is us taking more time than we ever have before because remember, we don't see them all the time, and actually asking them how they're doing, what matters to them, and what we can do within the resources that we have to really help them to be rock stars, basically. And so imagine that. Imagine that we would have conversations with people and we'd say, we actually have some flexibility in how we compensate you. Um, we realize that some people would like to work more remotely. Some people might prefer some more time off as opposed to salary. Some people might like us to invest some of the resources we have in learning and taking classes that matter to them. But you tell us what matters to you and we'll commit to trying to do that within the best of our ability. We no longer think of the world as kind of one size fits all. You enter here as an associate, you then rise to senior associate. We pay you the exact same way. If you're lucky after that, you become a manager if you stay that long. But so I want you to think about just the notion that not only is everyone different, but everyone matters and our ability to stay connected and be regularly engaging with people around what matters to them is gonna be fundamental to us keeping them. Think about this simple notion. If I'm working and it looks like a bunch of you are at your dining room table and some of you might be at a desk somewhere in your house or apartment, the reality is if I don't figure out a way to understand you better and connect with you better um, than other folks, what's to stop somebody else from sending you an email saying, I'd like to hire you and offer you a bonus? You say, hey, sitting at my dining room table anyway, um, doing the same work, why not? And so I'd like you to think a little bit differently about that. So I'd love you to think about the whole notion um, that we need to be um, more employee centric than company or employer centric in terms of the way we engage with all of our people. Having said that, I think there are five things we need to do to keep the hearts and minds of people and especially our best people. And remember as organizations, we sink or swim based on whether we can get the best out of our people. And so the first is the simple notion that we need to make sure everyone believes 
that they have a chance to do work that really matters and work that has some purpose. Um, and so I realize not every job is awesome, um, but it's our job as kind of managers and leaders to at least help people to understand what our purpose is as an organization and why what they do really matters. So I don't know about all of you, but you probably can think back to a time, maybe in one of your first jobs, when you did stuff that wasn't particularly remarkable or exciting. Um, and we've all had jobs like that. I think back to, well, my first job, I was 14 and I worked at McDonald's, which could be part of the reason why I'm now a vegetarian. But the um, but if I think about the first real job I had, it was a horrendous job. And I know it's kind of interesting, you know, when our kids complain that they don't have as much responsibility or assignment. But my first real job, I worked as a subway mechanic for BART. And so if you've ever been in San Francisco, here's a BART train. Um, and I'd like you to think about this train because I had a really exciting job the day I arrived. First, so by way of full disclosure, my dad was one of the designers of BART, and so he was the general manager of operations. So he was nice enough to get me a job in which all the people there were going to actually make my life miserable just to show me how hard the work was. And so um, first, he made sure I had a night job. And so I worked 11 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock in the morning. That was designed on his part to make sure I didn't party. Um, and so that was a pretty good thing. But the exciting thing about the job was the first day I arrived, I heard over the loudspeaker, this was a huge facility. This was a facility that was 800,000 square feet in which trains came in at night and we made repairs on them. But I heard my name, would young Mr. Gregerman please report to the pit? And I thought that was pretty exciting, actually. On my first day, they recognized me and I got responsibility. And as I got to the pit, they gave me what appeared to be the garb that a fireman might wear. And I totally covered myself up. And then they gave me a hose, which got me really excited. So I said, oh, so I get to clean the trains. And they said, well, not exactly. What you get to do, because you're our newest employee, and because I guess your dad wants you to have this job, is you're gonna go under all the trains during the course of the day that have run over an animal, and you're gonna clean off the bottoms of the trains so no animal parts stay stuck and mess up the trains. Well, as somebody who's always had dogs and loved animals, this was not the ideal dream job that I had imagined. And I got to do that job every day that I showed up at work. That was my first assignment for, um, I got to, and here you can see the, well, you can't see much of the underside of a BART train, but I got to do that for four months until it was clear that I was really good at that job. And then another young person came and started out and I got to hand that job off to people. So granted, not every job is awesome, um, but the reality is the way we get people to feel engaged and connected with their job is to always remind them of what we're trying to accomplish as a company or organization and always help them to see how what they do, even if it's cleaning the underside of trains, is really important to the future of the organization being successful. That without all of us doing the stuff we do, we can't be successful. Uh, quickly, I think quicker than we did it in the past though, we need to make sure that we're giving people opportunities to do work that's interesting. Whether it's the heart of their job, or whether it's that we ask them for their advice and input on other things that matter to our organization. We need to be really focused on the notion of keeping people engaged and tapping all of the insight and intelligence that they have. The second thing we really need to do well is we need to focus even better than we have in the past on the power of learning. So as you all know, the world's changing super fast. And so learning becomes, and learning new things becomes really, really important. Um, and learning new things is less about um, what you studied in school and more about all of these different skills that make you kind of quick on your feet and give you another tool that enables you to be more effective in your job. We need to be talking to our folks and understanding what things they'd like to learn 
most importantly, from the perspective of not only their job now, but advancing their career. But I'd even argue that the most kind of visionary organizations are also asking people what other things they'd like to learn that the community and that they're in, the company or organization can support to help them feel more fulfilled as a person. So think about all the things that would be beneficial to have your team members know, whether they're hard skills, um, and there's a growing kind of interesting set of hard skills that people are eager to learn and that are valuable. And those can be hard skills like the basics of design thinking. They can be something related to data analytics or data science. All those things are increasingly important for virtually all our organizations or soft skills like being better at communicating, learning how to collaborate effectively. Um, being better at not procrastinating, or at times, interestingly, being better at procrastinating. We have a lot of data that suggests that people who procrastinate often come up with breakthrough ideas. Um, so there's a lot of things that we'd like people to learn um, that we should help them to learn so they can be more valuable team members and employees. But as I mentioned, a bunch of really insightful companies are even asking people if there's a skill you'd like to learn that may not have direct application to what we do now, um, but would make you happier um, and feel more fulfilled as a person and as an employee, what would that be? And people are saying things like, I'd like to learn another language. Um, and companies are um, helping people and often paying the cost or at least giving them the time to take Spanish classes or French classes or Chinese classes or whatever language might be valuable. Um, some people are saying, I'd love to learn to cook. Um, some people are saying, I'd love to learn a musical instrument or practice my musical ability. Interestingly, the more we appreciate and recognize people as complete people, the more we have a chance to kind of keep them and keep them engaged, even at a time when they don't come into the office very often. But I think learning is really important. And the organizations that understand that people, especially their smartest people, want to continue to learn new things are the ones that are going to be successful. Um, the third thing I'd love you to think about is even when people aren't coming into the office very often, as well as certainly when people are, um, people have a compelling desire to belong. And um, it's just part of human nature. People want to feel that they're part of something that's bigger than themselves. And we need to make sure that people feel they belong or recognize that their voices are valuable and that they have a chance to truly make a difference in our organization. Um, I spend a lot of time wandering around, even in the pandemic, especially since I got my booster shot, kind of going to companies and organizations looking for best practices. And there's a company that I really, I love lots of companies, but a company that I absolutely adore. And whenever I go in there, it's clear I'm not the target customer. And that's a company called Lush Cosmetics. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to Lush, but I'm actually nuts about Lush. Um, I'm nuts about a place that can actually create um, soap that looks like cheese. I'm nuts about a place that does no animal testing. Um, especially given my job on the trains. The, um, I'm nuts about a place that actually has employees who are absolutely rabid about working there. And so this is a natural care product retail store. This is not like the dream, the mother load of places to work. And yet why are people passionate about working there? Well, for a few reasons. One is they're allowed to be themselves. And so if you see the typical Lush employee, they probably have a lot of ink on and they probably have a lot of body piercings. Um, and that's cool for the company. And while it may be an issue for some of you when you go in the store, after you talk to these people, you would love to hire them in a moment. But that's not all. The company also asks them for their input in most things that the company does. And the company does something that I find is remarkable that all of you can do. So this is Lush um, Ocean Salt. It's a perfectly reasonable product. I don't use it. I bought it for family members. But if you notice on the side here, there's a picture of a guy named Mac. And Mac is an employee at Lush. In fact, Mac is the guy who made this. 
Lush doesn't have a big factory in which machines make everything. They talk about making all their products in bakeries in which individuals actually make things and they let it be known who is the person who makes stuff. So now Mac, who makes this face and body kind of cream, um, Mac feels that what he does not only matters, but that the world sees his picture and knows that he does it. But that's not all that they do there. So Lush is what we might call a purpose-driven company, and I believe all your organizations can be purpose-driven. One of the things that Lush does is one day a month, they give all of their proceeds from certain products to nonprofits picked by the employees. They literally ask their employees, if you were to donate money or have the company donate money, which nonprofits and which causes would matter to you? And the employees get the chance to kind of say what matters to them. And then they see that in their stores. If it's a local nonprofit, they put up banners and then they see that input that they gave has made a difference in the organization. So I'd love you to think about that, but it's all about belonging. And belonging is about being involved, being asked your opinion, being appreciated. Now it's interesting, I went to a workshop just before the pandemic in which the speaker amusingly noticed that with today's young people, um, they're not patient enough to wait to be the employee of the month. They would like companies to have employee of the day um, just so they can be appreciated more often. Um, I give young people a lot more credit than that. In fact, I believe young people will be the folks who will turn the world around if it's to be turned around. Um, and I believe they don't need to be employed today, but they do need, whether they're in the office or remotely, to know that we appreciate them and care about them and they belong. Now, here's a really weird thing about the virtual world that actually makes it easier. Imagine you lead an organization and in the past, let's say you had five locations or 10 locations or a few hundred employees and your commitment because you wanted to do the right thing was to connect with all of those people when you could, it would involve a fair amount of travel and logistics. The reality is with online and people's comfort with online, we can literally kind of book appointments, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minute check-in appointment every month with all of our folks, even in far flung places and simply get on a computer and engage with them. That's kind of a cool thing. So there are advantages to technology. Um, I'm not saying that that's what we want to rely on as the main way we do it, but let's use those as an advantage to stay connected and let people know they belong and let people know that we're constantly interested in their ideas. Um, the fourth thing I'd like you to think about, and this is based on talking with a lot of young people is, it appears to me that an awful lot of young people would like to work for organizations that are trying to make a difference in the community, that aren't totally focused on just the bottom line. I believe they're smart enough to realize that we need to make money to be successful, but young people are gravitating toward organizations that commit to giving back to the community and that give them opportunities to do that. And so whether we create opportunities in which we tutor young kids or are part of a food drive or work at a homeless shelter um, or clean up the community. Um, I believe our ability to suggest to people that part of what we are hopeful they'll do is also work to make our community a better place is gonna challenge people um, to not only make a difference, but also feel that what they do and what we do is particularly compelling. So I'd love you to think about that. And the last thing I'd like you to think about is that people want to work in a place where they can have fun with the folks they work with. Now, the interesting thing we found from the pandemic is they don't expect to have fun with them all the time, um, but they'd like to have fun on reasonable occasion or somewhat regularly with their coworkers. So even if I'm working remotely, I like the company that I'm working with to organize a chance to get together, um, hopefully in person, but if not virtually, to do fun things together. And whether that's a trivia night online or getting together for pizza or to ride go-karts or to do whatever we do, 
connecting with our coworkers in a way where we simply have designed it to have fun is an important thing to do. One of the things I've been doing with lots of our customers is we design kind of fun team building kind of, I guess you could call it scavenger hunts, but we have teams race through cities looking for new ideas. We do a lot of those in the Washington area. Um, and we have people signed up. I mean, some of them keep getting pushed off um, because of COVID and new variants, but we have lots of people signed up to kind of bring people back together and have them get to know each other through the context of kind of exploring the world and having fun together and finding out things about DC that they haven't found out before. So I'd love you to think about just the idea of bringing people together. So think about those things and how we keep people engaged. We keep them engaged by showing that we care, that we understand who they are. We keep them engaged um, by making sure that not only do they have the chance to do work that's interesting, but they see where the work that they do fits into the kind of broader success of the organization. We keep them engaged by making sure that they understand where a place where we want them to learn new things. And why wouldn't we want them to learn new things? Because if they're not learning new things, then we're not keeping up as an organization. Um, where they feel that they belong and they're appreciated, where we do good work in the community together, and where we have fun together. So what does it mean for the office? For those, as I mentioned before, a bunch of you have folks on site or work in retail or work in healthcare and have to go to work. But for those of you who do primarily office things or have a team of people who do office things, um, let's be realistic. If an awful lot of what your people did was they simply came into the office, opened their laptop and did the same work they could do at home, um, people are gonna have less tolerance for doing that. So we need to rethink about what the office is all about and when we bring people together. What's interesting now is, and I mentioned a little while ago, the idea of being employee centric as opposed to the idea of being kind of company or organization centric is, if somebody can do something that really doesn't need to be with other people or in the office, we need to be more flexible about giving them the opportunity to do that. Um, ultimately, we want people to do great work and get work done and be happy about the work that they're doing. Um, and so that probably means that people don't need to be in the office five days a week. And when they come in the office, we should make it so that their time is felt to be particularly valuable. We should give them the chance when they come in the office to collaborate, to innovate, to think in new ways, to learn things which if they learn things together would be more valuable to the organization. Um, we need to encourage them to come in the office when we're gonna give them the opportunity to learn and grow and be mentored. Um, it forces us though to rethink who we assign to be mentors. In the past, we just assign people to be mentors because they were senior or they were somebody's boss without necessarily training that person on how to be a good mentor. I think we need to do a better job because we need to make mentoring valuable. And part of the way we make mentoring valuable is to make sure that the people who are doing the mentoring are actually pretty skilled at doing it. So I'd love you to think about that. But so we need to bring people back when there's a clear kind of purpose, when we want to share information in which being all together would be more valuable, not just sharing the information from a meeting, when we want to create kind of breakthroughs by thinking creatively about a project, when we want to think about our future or think about new products, services, or solutions. So there are a variety of reasons, but this probably isn't going to be five days a week. And so if we're not gonna bring people in five days a week, then we need to think about, would it be best to have the energy um, of bringing people in for one, two or three days a week and having them all in in the same days? And I think if we're gonna do that, then I would be inclined to think that we ought to make those days Tuesdays, Wednesdays or Thursdays. And the reason I think about that is um, that I think about that people have actually figured out how to have longer weekends and still be productive. They've figured out that maybe they can go somewhere on Friday for a long weekend, as long as it has good bandwidth and still work most of Friday, but end up wherever they want to be, whether it's at the beach or Berkeley Springs or any other place. And so I'd love us to think about as we start to bring people back, thinking about days that are kind of more, again, employee-centric and less kind of organization-centric. 
I'd also like us to think about the fact that we need to be kind of leaders and managers in very different ways and that that's okay. Um, but it means that we need to develop some new skills. We need to listen better. Um, and I know a lot of you were great listeners before, but we need to ask a lot of really good questions and listen better. And we need to really begin by asking people, what will it take for them to be remarkable? We need to be better at connecting with our people. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, I think we can use some of these tools to connect with people in kind of remarkable ways. We need to be better communicators. If some of our people are in the office and some of them are remote, we need to think about how to create compelling communications that everybody gets so that everybody's on the same page. And then we need to know when to bring people together, either in person or virtually to communicate effectively with them. We need truly to be better at delegating. You know, I think part of the kind of the challenge that we had as leaders in the past was we felt really good when we could see everybody and see that they were working. Um, and now we just have to trust them that they're getting work done. And we have a pretty good way to tell whether their work's getting done, whether or not they're in the office or not. And as I mentioned at the outset, we need to be better at actually living the elements of culture that we believe are fundamental. Ultimately, it's your culture and your ability to embrace um, the way people want to work and incorporate it into your culture that's going to determine whether or not people want to stay. Remember, it's kind of an interesting world. A, a recent Fast Company study suggested that the average time that a person in their 20s to 30s um, stays with an organization is about a year. And so if it's about a year and we as an organization want to keep our best people, we've got to do things differently than other people would to keep them engaged. We've got to show them that we care about them, that we understand them as people, that we want them to grow, that we want to involve them in things that really matter. We've got to show them that we're willing to make a difference. And we've got to appreciate as well that we're not only just competing with the other organizations like ours in the DMV, we're competing with an entire world filled with people who could be remarkable employees to our organizations um, and figure out how to work remotely and kind of be valuable. So I'm going to kind of leave it at that. Let me stop at that and then either take any questions or I would love to gain some of your insight um, about what you're doing that you feel works, um, what are the challenges you face. So I will take a deep breath. So let's, uh, Ali, you wanna go for it. Thank you, this was absolutely terrific. And Mark, thank you for getting this set up. Alan, this was fantastic, so thank you. Oh, my, my question is my leading to back to culture and creating different cultures at work. You have so many different, um, you know, workforce is always the number one issue that keeps CEOs up at night. And within those cultures, you have a lot of different generations. Some like recognition, some like pay raises. What are your thoughts on different, not ways of recognizing individuals, but the employee recognition versus merit raises versus time off versus more vacation, things like that. No, so that's a great question, and I think you're exactly right. But I think it gets to the notion, you know, that I talked a little bit about, but certainly I'd love to talk with people more about, and that is we really need to do a better job of understanding people as individuals. And part of understanding them as individuals is we need to ask them what kind of motivates them, what would energize them to wake up and be excited to be part of our organization each and every day, whether they come into the office or do it remotely. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, then I think we can, I'm really about the notion within our resources of tailoring the way we engage with each of our people. And as managers, I think that's a doable thing. And I think we kind of really need to do it. So we need to ask them among all the things that are part of a job that are really important, what are the most important things to you? And I think we also need to be tied to your question. I think we need to show them that at the heart of our culture and the way we engage with them is willing to be flexible and realizing that their world and their needs may change at times. They could have a sick family member. They could have, it could be a busy season for one of their kids in a sport or a school play and they want more flexibility then. But because we trust them, we know we're gonna get kind of a lot of work out of them um, and a lot of great work out of them 
when they're fully engaged and if they could have a little bit of time to do something that's special to them. So um, they may be needing to move an older parent kind of from an area. So lots of things come up. If we don't know those things, we can't know. As I always like to say with almost all the organizations I work with, um, unless we have kind of deep conversations with people and find out what matters to them, we'll never be able to really offer the value that we offer. I think the best organizations, especially with employees who've been there a while, know them really well. And I think the other thing you mentioned is there's a huge generational shift going on. And so what I find is I talk to people who are kind of older, who spent 30 years working in an office, and this has been hell for them, the pandemic, because they couldn't go into the office. And the first time they heard the coast was cleared, they, they went into the office. And so there are certain people who feel that the office is a huge part of work. There are other people who feel that it's not. We need to be more flexible about that. There are people who are in their careers at a stage in which um, even though we always should all be learning new things, I've said, I'm less interested in the learning part of it. I just want to have interesting assignments and be able to work on those. So I believe everything is this idea that we're going to kind of have to customize the work experience. Let's find that balance, right? Yeah. And yeah. find what works best for people. But if we're always communicating and asking and we can't deliver on all that, that's better than never asking because we never know. Everybody, it turns out, let's be honest, all of you as wonderful as you are and all of our employees, they all have a backstory and it takes a bit of time to get to know what that backstory is. And understanding that backstory helps us to really understand them as a person, to show not only they belong, but then I believe to do a bit more to tailor the work environment and the work experience so that they can be successful, make a difference, but also be able to accommodate what that is.